Well, welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many people here, um, many of whom I haven't seen for quite a long time. Um, I think quite a few of you, you go back to the very early days of Inmos. Um, and uh, uh, I hope this works well. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the Inmos and the way the cluster here has developed over the years. Um, uh, I'm then going to hand over to several people who are going to talk about their experiences, I hope. Um, and uh, then I'm, I think that uh, at the end of the evening, Ian Byron, who is here with us, who was the original British founder of Inmos, uh, he's going to say a few, few words himself. So um, we'll see how quickly we can get through this lot. We're going to video it, so Ed over there will be orchestrating the arrangements here and trying to make sure we capture it all. Um, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, um, if I can remember much about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's curious when you when you start looking back at history like this. It's uh, I realise that um, you know computers have not been around for all that long, really. Just my lifetime. Uh, I was born just about two years after the first computers became operational in Cambridge, which were some of the first in the world. Um, and they were built by Maurice Wilkes and David Wheeler and friends. Twenty years later, those same people were teaching me as a student in Cambridge, and I graduated as the first computer science graduate from King's College, 1972, and then I decided to do something really trendy. I went off to Warwick University to do artificial intelligence. It was very fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I got particularly interested in robotics. Um, and at that time, a robot in the lab was a great big machine that trundled backwards and forwards with a wire connecting it to a computer in the next room. And I wanted my robots to be small, self-contained things. And the microprocessor had just been invented in 1971-72, the first microprocessors were shipped. Um, and I thought the obvious thing to do is to just put a collection of microprocessors into the robot, dedicate them to actuators, sensors, network them together, write the programs, job done. Easy. And being young and foolish, I thought I'd spend a few months just going off and doing that before I got back to the robots. And that took me into a whole realm of what was becoming called distributed computing. Um, uh, and more people in the UK and around the world were getting interested in distributed computing. Um, and in particular, I came into contact with a number of important people in my life. One of them was Tony Hoare, who was developing some of the theory behind all this stuff in Oxford. And the other was, was Ian Barron, who was at the time was advising the government about its industrial strategy and also advising the Research Council about its distributed computing strategy, as far as I remember. The end was a project. <laughs> um, so um, it came about that um, at the time, of course, the, the UK government had an industrial strategy. Uh, it had also a thing called the National Enterprise Board that was investing uh, substantial amounts of money in both, both rescuing public sector companies and was persuaded to invest in startups. And Ian and his two co-founders, American co-founders of Inmos, persuaded the National Enterprise Board and the government to invest £50 million in a startup microelectronics venture, which came to be called Inmos. Um, um, not all that surprisingly, um, within a fairly short time of the office opening here in Bristol, exactly 40 years ago, um, I got a phone call inviting me to come to see uh, Inmos in Bristol. And after I'd been here for about an hour or so, I was asked if I was going to join the company. Um, so it was a fairly rapid uh, process. And I did join the company uh, in the following year. Um, it grew fairly rapidly over that year, particularly as a, uh, there was a, an, an attempt to recruit a few graduates. Um, the idea was to recruit three or four. Uh, 21 very promising looking youngsters turned up. Um, and um, they were sort of sort of interviewed and they were asked about what job offers they had. And the person organizing all this said, they have about four or five job offers each between them. So if you want to get four or five of the 21, you better offer them all jobs. So we did. And every single one accepted. So, <laughs> so, so my, my wife, or perhaps she was the girlfriend at the time, I'm not sure, um, used to say, uh, it's just a bit like walking into the students' union, walking into the uh, in-boss office. Um, uh, anyway, it was very lively, and looking back on it, it was incredibly effective from the point of view of the growth of the region, because Inmos more, more or less became a magnet for young talent in the 1980s. Um, and uh, many of those people are still around, even here, um, and uh, have gone on to start other ventures after Inmos. Um, we, um, of course, went on to do all the things that Inmos is known for doing. We produced the first microcomputers designed for parallel computing. Uh, on the way, we invented a new computer-aided design system, another programming language, an integrated development environment with hyperlink 
files, and all and so on and so on. There was no shortage of innovation. Um, I think um, you know the the youngsters there helped that along, but I think probably. Uh, both Ian and I have always been a bit guilty of innovating, uh, probably slightly more than was needed. But <laughs> um, anyway, everything uh, was sort of going okay for a while. Um, then, but of course, the government had changed in the meantime. So the new government didn't really believe in all this business of investing in, in things like startups and putting public sector money into industry. So um, they wanted to sell in Moss as quickly as possible. Um, and eventually we were sold to a conglomerate called Thorn EMI. Um, this was great news for the um, Inmos employee shareholders, uh, but not such good news for Thorn EMI, who found they'd, they'd bought something that they didn't really understand. And within a fairly short time, the bottom fell out of Inmos's most important market, which was Dynamic Rams at the time. Um, so they were quite keen to sell us again, and they sold us again to, this time, to SGS Thompson Microelectronics, um, which effectively brought um, ST into the, ST Microelectronics, as it was called later, uh, into the Bristol region. Um, of course, whenever these mergers and acquisitions of small companies by large ones happen, an inevitable thing starts to happen, spin-outs happen, because many of the people that are perfectly happy working in small companies aren't very interested in working in big ones. The first spin-out from Inmos, as far as I know, was a company called Mako, um, that actually put Bristol on the map as far as parallel computing was concerned. Um, and became fairly well known in the parallel computing area. And a, a rather interesting trajectory that goes from Mako and is the reason why we currently have Cray here in the region. So that, that started a, a whole train of events. Um, another spin-out was that's quite a, uh, had a significant effect was Division, uh, which was a, a very early VR company, uh, which again led setting place train a series of events um, that you'll hear a little bit about in a minute, I hope. Um, and there were others. Um, SN Systems was actually co-founded by a, an Inmos software developer. That's now the basis of all Sony's uh, software for developing computer games, and it's here right in Bristol. The last thing I did for ST was to invent a pro program called Chameleon, um, which was an attempt to build a, a system on chip architecture. Um, it attracted a lot more people. The design team was quite large. It was quite well funded. And so more people were brought into the region uh, to join that team. Um, uh, another side effect of the ST uh, microelectronics uh, uh, pr presence was that we were able to develop products for consumer microelectronics. Uh, an obvious example was the set-top box chip. It was a reworked version of the transputer architecture um, and was sold in hundreds of millions over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, the, the Ockerman transputer user groups in the meantime grew to a peak of about 5,000 people across, spread across 50 countries. So this was quite a big enterprise overall. By 1995, I had decided that I was amongst the category of people who belonged in small companies rather than big ones. Um, so I took the opportunity to move into the university um, and became the head of the computer science department. Um, and having had the experience of seeing the way in which this technology was going to influence media in all its forms and networking, I set about building some relationships with the local media industry and discovered it was quite big. Uh, Bristol has a huge presence in, in film and TV production dating back to the BBC days of natural history productions. Um, and I found it easy enough to make relationships with the BBC, with Ardman, with Watershed, and so on. And we set in motion some projects, the, the Creative Technology Network, an experimental high-speed network to connect the, the local media industry. We put in with help from Telewest in uh, around about 2000. Um, and we had various projects working with the media industry and bringing computing and digital media together. We did roughly the same thing with our students. We got them writing computer games as their group project work. Um, we taught them about graphics and animation and so on. And another thing that happened which I think has had a significant impact was uh, that a colleague of mine, a friend, dropped in at one point whilst I was making curriculum changes and said, why do the MIT students all have business plans in their pockets and yours don't? And I thought, well, that's quite an interesting question. So I invented a project which was all about um, building a prototype of something and writing a business plan about it. Um, and uh, we started doing that. And over a period of about four or five years, I discovered the answer to my friend's question, which is we hadn't been expecting them to. As soon as we gave them the opportunity, they started producing business plans as good as anyone else's. Um, so 
That's continued to this day, uh, and I hope there were one or two of the students inv involved in that thing in the room. Um, not sure. Yes, I think there's one or two at the back there. <laughs> Certainly Ben was involved as a student. Um, so what, where have we got to? Well, um, what happened towards the end of the 1990s uh, was that um, uh, more investment appeared. Infineon took the opportunity to open a design centre here, um, recruiting some people from ST, but bringing a lot more people into the region as well. Um, investment became a bit easier, and we saw Element 14, Pika Chip, Elixent all started up um, in, in, in the immediate region, all of which have had a, a legacy. They've, they've led to other, other um, projects and other companies. Um, we've had a number of smaller companies which have also st often stemmed from the Inmos legacy, Math Embedded in security, Red 7 Studios in mobile games, Blue Wireless in 5G, some of them you're going to be hearing from today, um, TVS in verification and OneCloud in cloud file systems. It was somewhere here as well. Um, um, uh, we've also had student startups. In fact, um, one of my students in 2004 came looking for a project um, I talked to him for a while uh, and suggested prototyping a, a new processor. Uh, as he was leaving the room, he said, what am I going to do about software? And I said, that's okay, I'll write you a compiler. Um, and I have to say, I've never been so skillfully managed by an undergraduate before. Um, anyway, between us, we put together a prototype of what became the Xmos processor. Um, and the, he wrote the business plan and uh, we set the thing going and it's still here today. Um, and of course, it's actually been quite instrumental in the creation of GraphCore. Um, uh, another re more recent development is Ultra Haptics, which you'll hear a little bit about today. Um, together, just those three companies employ over 300 people and have attracted investment of over $250 million. Um, so not a bad achievement from uh, a few student startups. Um, um, and we have others in a completely different space. We have things like Opposable and, and all the VR community that I know less about, but we have someone here who will be able to tell us. Um, so um, quite a strong presence has, has, has grown in microelectronics, HPC and cloud computing, games and VR, and so on. Okay. Um, some, in some cases, established people from the Inmos days right the way through to student founders and students who have joined these companies. Okay. And we're going, getting better at actually supporting them. We have the Set Squared community, Engine Shed, the Pervasive Media Studio, the Quantum Technology Enterprise Center, the Bristol Robotics Lab with its incubator, and the new, relatively newly formed Virtual Reality Lab. Um, and the place you're currently sitting is one of the most recent educational ventures. This is the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And in this room, um, the students do their work together. It's all project work in teams. Um, and they are all on university courses that allow them to combine a conventional academic subject with learning about design and, and entrepreneurship. Um, uh, we're in our third year of running that program. There are about 11 or 12 subjects involved. Um, and uh, whenever they're working in the design and entrepreneurship, they work in groups uh, together in cross-disciplinary teams. So that is uh, the latest um, thing we've done. I think it's unique in the UK and certainly fairly unusual in the world. Um, and that brings me more or less to the end of this part of the, uh, the, 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 the meeting. Um, uh, what am I doing next? Well, I'm still working on... Um, I can't give up, actually. I keep signing new processes. So we have another, another experiment now, which is uh, taking note of the fact that the people's um, preferences in, in programming languages and programming tools is changing. Um, we, we've now moved on to pro masses of programming being done in languages like Python uh, and other l uh, languages of that kind. They are not very well supported by conventional architectures, uh, and it raises an important question as to whether it's time to do make another shift in architecture, rather like the one that happened 20 or 30 years ago when we moved from complex instruction sets to simple ones, responding to the fact that all the code was being written in high-level languages. Now the high-level languages are there, but they're new high-level languages. Most of the people you will be able to hire in the future will know nothing about C. They'll know about Python and, and, and similar. So we need to get our architectures lined up to do this. This means automatic memory management and a whole lot of other things which need to be built in, I think, at the hardware level. So that's one of my projects. Two of the, my students here that are working on that are in the room. Um, and uh, we, I'm sure they'll talk to you later um, if, uh, if they get a chance. Um, I, the other thing that I should mention that I think Bristol ought to be doing, and you seem to be the right people around the table to do it with a potential interest, I think Bristol should have a computer history museum. 
It's got aerospace and all the rest of it, but there's nowhere that's celebrating all this stuff or telling the rest of the world here what we do. If you look at Cambridge, they have this great place which is sort of a museum, but the real thing it is is a venue. Um, and so what happens is that the parents and, uh, come in and play the retro computer games and the kids learn how to code. Um, and I'm sure you know, we ought to be able to put that together uh, here in Bristol. So I'd love to talk about that if anybody wants to follow it up. Um, uh, the other thing I should say is, if you want to do a bigger event that has even more people, it wouldn't be difficult. Since organising this event, I've had numerous emails and things from people far away from Bristol saying, what's going on? <laughs> Are you going to invite us? <laughs> so, <laughs> but that, that may have to wait another 10 years. Um, so <laughs> so um, now we're going to fairly rapidly go through uh, a number of talks, um, and I think we're starting with Miles, aren't we? I think, well, that was the, you were on the batting list, <laughs> and you were the first startup. 